Part One, Chapter Seven B, of the Adventures of Jimmy Dale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Jimmy Dale by Frank L. Packard, reading by Lars Rolander. Part One, The Man in the Case. Chapter Seven B, The Thief, continued. But for a sort of tinselled ostination, the place might well have been the Marlianne's that he had just left. It was crowded, and riot was at its height. A stringed orchestra in Hungarian costume played what purported to be Hungarian airs. Shouts, laughter, clatter of dishes, and thump of stains added to the din. He made his way between the close-packed tables to the stairs, and descended to the lower floor. Here, if anything, the confusion was greater than above, but here, too, was an exit through to the rear street, and a moment later he was sauntering past the front of an unkept little pawn-shop closed for the night. Over whose door, in the murk of a distant street lamp, three balls hang in sagging disarray, tawny with age, and across whose dirty, unwashed windows, letters missing, ran this legend, Is, Ak, Pelina, Pawn, Brock, Rr. The pawn shop made the corner of a very dark and narrow lane and with a quick glance round him to assure himself that he was unobserved, Jimmy Dale stepped into the alleyway, and, lost instantly in the blacker shadows, stole along by the wall of the pawn-shop. Old Isaac's business was not all done through the front door. And then, suddenly, Jimmy Dale shrank still, closer against the wall. Was it intuition, premonition, or reality? There seemed an uncanny feeling of presence around him, as though perhaps he were watched, as though others beside himself were in the lane. Yes, ahead of him a shadow moved. He could just barely distinguish it now, that his eyes had grown accustomed to the darkness. It, like himself, was close against the wall, and now it slunk noiselessly down the length of the lane until he lost sight of it. And what was that? He strained his ears to listen. It seemed like a window being opened or closed, cautiously, stealthily, the fraction of an inch at a time. And then he located the sound. It came from the other side of the lane, and very nearly opposite to where on the second floor a dull yellow glow shone out from old Isaac's private den in the rear of the pawnshop's office. Jimmy Dale's brows were gathered in sharp furrows. There was evidently something afoot tonight, of which the toxin had not sounded the alarm. And then the frown relaxed, and he smiled a little. Miraculous as was the means through which she obtained the knowledge that was the basis of their strange partnership, it was no more miraculous than her unerring accuracy in the minutest details. The toxin had never failed him yet. It was possible that something was afoot around him, quite probable indeed, since he was in the most vicious part of the city, in the heart of gangland. But whatever it might be, it was certainly extraneous to the mission, or she would have mentioned it. The lane was empty now, he was quite sure of that, and there was no further sound from the window opposite. He started forward once more, only to halt again, for the second time as abruptly as before, squeezing, if possible, even more closely against the wall. Someone had turned into the lane from the sidewalk, and, walking hurriedly, choosing with evident precaution the exact centre of the alleyway, came toward him. The man passed, his hurried stride a half-run, and, a few feet beyond, halted at old Isaac's side door. From somewhere inside the old building, Jimmy Dale's ears caught the faint ringing of an electric bell, a long ring, followed in quick succession by three short ones, 
then the repeated clicking of a latch as though pulled by a cord from above and the man passed in through the door closing it behind him jimmie dale nodded to himself in the darkness it was a spring lock the signal was one long ring and three short ones the tocsin had not missed even those small details also burton was late for his appointment for that must have been burton business such as old isaac had in hand that night would have permitted the entrance of no other visitor but k wilmington madden's private secretary he moved down the lane to the door and tried it softly it was locked of course the slim tapering sensitive fingers whose tips were eyes and ears to jimmie dale felt over the lock and a slender little steel instrument slipped into the keyhole a moment more and the catch was released and the door under his hand began to open with it ajar he paused his eyes searching intently up and down the lane there was nothing no sign of anyone no moving shadows now his gaze shifted to the window opposite directly facing it now with a dull reflection upon it from the lighted window of old isaac's den above his head he could make out that it was open but that was all once more he smiled a little tolerantly at himself this time someone had been in the lane someone had opened the window of his or her room in that tenement house across from him surely there was nothing surprising unnatural or even out of the commonplace in that he had been a little bit on edge himself perhaps and the sudden movement of that shadow unexpected had startled him for the moment as in all probability the opening of the window had startled the skulking figure itself into action the door was open now he stepped noiselessly inside and closed it noiselessly behind him he was in a narrow hall where a few yards away a light shone down a stairway at right angles to the hall itself rear door of pawn shop opens into hall and exactly opposite very short flight of stairs leading directly to doorway of isaac's den above ramshackle old place low ceilings isaac when sitting in his den can look down and by means of a transom of the rear door of the shop see the customers as they enter from the street while he also keeps an eye on his assistant latter always locks up and leaves promptly at six o'clock jimmie dale was subconsciously repeating to himself snatches from the tocsin's letter which as subconsciously in reading he had memorized almost word for word and now voices reached him one excited nervous as though the speaker were laboring under mental strain that bordered closely on the hysterical the other curiously mingling querulousness with an attempt to pacify but dominantly contemptuous sneering cold jimmie dale moved along the hall very slowly without a sound testing each step before he threw his body weight from one leg to the other he reached the foot of the stairs the tocsin had been right it was a very short flight he counted the steps there were eight above facing him a door was open the voices were louder now it was a sordid looking room what he could see of it poverty stricken in its appearance intentionally so probably for effect with no attempt whatever at furnishing he could see through the doorway to the window that opened on the alleyway or rather just glimpsed the top of the window at an angle across the room that and a bare street of floor the two men were not in the line of vision burton's voice it was unquestionably burton speaking came to jimmie dale now distinctly no i didn't i tell you i didn't i i i hadn't the nerve jimmie dale slipped his black silk mask over his face and with extreme caution on hands and knees began to climb the stairs so it was old isaac now in a half purr half sneer and i was so sure my young friend that you had i was so sure that you were not such a fool 
Yes, I could even have sworn that they were in your pocket now. What? It is too bad, too bad. It is not a pleasant thing to think of. That little chair up the river in its horrible little room where... For God's sake, Isaac, not that. Do you hear? Not that. My God, I didn't mean to. I didn't know what I was doing. Jimmie Dale crept up another step, another and another. There was silence for a moment in the room. Then Burton again, hoarse-voiced. Isaac, I'll make good to you some other way. I swear, I will, I swear it. If I'm caught at this, I'll, I'll get fifteen years for it. And which would you rather have? Jimmie Dale could picture the oily smirk, the shrug of his shoulders, the outthrust hands, palms upwards, elbows in at the hips, the fingers curved and wide apart. Fifteen years, or what you get for murder? Eh, my friend, you have thought of that, eh? It is a very little price, I ask, yes? Damned you! Burton's voice was shrill, then dropped to half-sob. No, no, Isaac, I, I didn't mean that. Only for God's sake be merciful. It is not only the risk of the penitentiary. It's more than that. I, I tried to play white all my life, and until that cursed night there's no man living could say I haven't. You know that. You know that, Isaac. I tell you, I couldn't do it this afternoon. I tell you, I couldn't. I tried to, and, and, and I couldn't. Jimmy Dale was lying flat on the little landing now, peering into the room. Back a short distance from the doorway, a repulsive-looking little man in unkempt clothes and soiled linen, with yellowish skin, parchment face, out of which small black eyes shone cunningly and shrewdly sat at a bare deal table in a rickety chair. Facing him across the table stood a young man of no more than twenty-five, clean-cut, well-dressed, but whose face was unnaturally white now, and whose hand, as he extended it in a pleading gesture toward the other, trembled visibly. Jimmy Dale's hand made its way quietly to a side pocket and extracted his automatic. Old Isaac humped his shoulders and leered at his visitor. We talk a great deal, my young friend. What is the use? A bargain is a bargain. A few rubies in exchange for your life. A few rubies and my mouth is shut. Otherwise... He humped his shoulders again. Well... Burton drew back, swept his hand in a dazed way across his eyes and laughed out suddenly in bitter mirth. "'A few rubies!' he cried. "'The most magnificent stones of this side of the water! A few rubies! It's been Madden's life hobby. Every child in New York knows that. A few! Yes, there's only a few, but those few are worth a fortune. He trusts me. The man has been like a father to me, and—' so. "'You are the very last to be suspected,' observed old Isaac suavely. "'Have I not told you that? There is nothing to fear. Did we not arrange everything so nicely, eh, my young friend? See, it was to-night that Madam gives a little reception to his friends, and did you not say that the rubies would be taken from the safe deposit vault this afternoon?' since his friends always clamoured to see them as a very fitting conclusion to an evening's entertainment. And did you not say that you very naturally had access to the safe in the library where you worked, and that he would not notice they were gone until he came to look for them some time this evening? I think you said all that. And what suspicion, let alone proof, would attach itself to you? You were out of the room once when he, too, was absent for perhaps half an hour? It is very simple. In that half hour, someone, somehow, abstracted them. Certainly it was not you. You see how little I ask. 
and I pay well, do I not? And so I gave you until to-night. Three days have gone, and I have said nothing, and the body has not been found, eh? But to-night, eh? It was understood. The rubies or the chair? Burton's lips moved, but it was a moment before he could speak. You wouldn't dare, he whispered thickly. You wouldn't dare. I tell the story of, of what you tried to make me do, and, and they send you up for it. Old Isaac shrugged with pitying contempt. Is it after all a fool I'm dealing with? he sneered. And I, what should I say? That you had stolen the stones from your employer and offered them as a bribe to silence me, and that I had refused? The very act of handing you over to the police would prove the truth of what I said and rob you of even a chance of leniency for that other thing. Is it not so, eh? And why did I not hand you over at once three nights ago? Believe me, my young friend, I should have a very good reason ready, a dozen if necessary, if it came to that. But we are borrowing trouble, are we not? We shall not come to that, eh? For a moment it seemed to Jimmy Dale, as he watched, that Burton would hurl himself upon the other, white to the lips, the muscles of his face twitching. Burton clenched his fists and leaned over the table, and then, with sudden revulsion of emotion, he drew back once more, and once more came that choked sob. "'You'll pay for this, Isaac. Your turn will come for this.' "'I have been threatened very often,' snapped the other contemptuously. Bah! What are threats? I laugh at them, as I always will. Then, with a quick change of front, his voice a sudden snarl. Well, we have talked enough. You have your choice. The stones are a, eh? and it is to-night. Now! The old pawnbroker sprawled back in his chair, a cunning leer on his vicious face, a gleam of triumph, greed in the beady, rat-like eyes that never wavered from the other. Burton, moisture oozing from his forehead, stood there, hesitant, staring back at old Isaac, half in a fascinated gaze, half as though trying to read some sign of weakness in the bestial countenance that confronted him. And then, very slowly, in an automatic, machine-like way, his hand groped into the inside pocket of his vest, and old Isaac cackled out his derision. So you thought you could bluff me, eh? You thought you could fool old Isaac? Bah! I read you like a book. Did I not tell you a while back that you had them in your pocket? I know your kind, my young friend. I know your kind very well indeed. It is my business. You would not have dared to come here tonight without the price. So you took them this afternoon as we agreed. Yes, yes, you did well. You will not regret it. And now let me see them. His voice rose eagerly. Let me see them now, my young friend. Yes, I took them, Burton spoke listlessly. God help me. Old Isaac, quivering, excited like a different creature now, sprang from his chair and as Burton drew a long, flat leather case from his pocket, snatched it from the other's hand. His fingers, in their rapacious haste, could not at first manipulate the catch, and then, finally, with the case open, he bent over the table feverishly. The light reflected back as from some living mass of crimson fire, now shading darkly, now glowing into wondrous, colorful transparency, as he moved the case to and fro with jerky motions of his hands, and he was babbling, crooning to himself like one possessed. Ah, the little beauties! Ah, the pretty little things! Yes, yes, these are the ones. This is the great Aragon, see, see, the six-sided prism, terminated by the six-sided pyramid. Ah, but it must be cut, it must be cut to sell it, eh? 
Ah, it's too bad, too bad. And this, this one here, I know them all, this is... But his sentence was never finished. It was Jimmy Dale on his feet now, leaning against the jamb of the door, his automatic covering the two men at the table who spoke. Quite so, Isaac, he said coolly. You know them all. Quite so, Isaac. But be good enough to drop them. The case fell from Isaac's hand. The flush on his cheeks died to a sickly pallor. And, his mouth half open, he stood like a man turned to stone, his hands with curved fingers still outstretched over the table, over the crimson gems that spilled from the case, lay scattered now on the table-top. Burton neither spoke nor moved. A little whiter, the misery in his face almost apathetic. He moistened his lips with the tip of his tongue. Jimmy Dale walked across the room, halted at the end of the table, and surveyed the two men grimly. And then, while one hand with the revolver extended rested easily on the table, the other gathered up the stones, placed them in the case, and the case in his pocket. Jimmy Dale's lips parted in an uninviting smile. I guess I'm in luck tonight, eh, Isaac? he drawled. Between you and your young friend, as I believe you call him, it would appear as though I had fallen on my feet. That Aracon's worth, what would you say, a hundred, two hundred thousand alone, eh? A very famous stone, that. Had your eye on it for quite a time, Isaac, you miserable blood leech, eh? Isaac did not answer, but while he still held back from the table, he seemed to be regaining a little of his composure. Burglars of whatever sort were no novelty to him, and was staring fixedly at Jimmy Dale. Can't place me, though there's not many in the profession you don't know. Is that it? inquired Jimmy Dale softly. Well, don't try, Isaac. It's hardly worth your while. I've got the stones now, and— Wait, wait, listen! It was Burton speaking for the first time, his words coming in quick, nervous rush. Listen, you don't— Hold your tongue, cried old Isaac, with sudden fierceness. You are a fool! He leaned toward Jimmy Dale, a crafty smile on his face, quite in control of himself once more. Don't listen to him. Listen to me. You're right. I can't place you, and it doesn't make any difference. He took a step forward. But— Not too close, Isaac, snapped Jimmy Dale sharply. I know you. So? ejaculated old Isaac, rubbing his hands together. So? Uh, that is good. That is what I want. Listen. We will make a bargain. We are birds of a feather, eh? All thieves, eh? You've got the drop on us who did all the work. But you'll give us our share, eh? Listen, you couldn't get rid of those stones alone. You know that. You're not so green at the game, eh? You'd have to go to someone. You know me. You know old Isaac, you say? Oh, well, then, you know there isn't another man in New York who dispose of those rubies and plays safe doing it, except me. I'll make a good bargain with you. Isaac, said Jimmy Dale pensively, you've made a good many good bargains. I wonder when you'll make your last. There is more than one looking for interest on those bargains in a pretty grim sort of way. Bah! ejaculated old Isaac. It is an old story. Oh, they are all alike. I am afraid of none of them. I hold them all like that. His hands opened and closed like a taloned claw. And you'd add me to the lot, eh? said Jimmy Dale. He lifted the revolver, its muzzle on old Isaac, examined the mechanism thoughtfully, and lowered it again. Very well, I'll make a bargain with you, providing it is agreeable to your young friend here. Ah, 
exclaimed old Isaac shrilly. So that is good. It's done then. He chuckled hoarsely. Any bargain I make he will agree to. Is it not so? He fixed his eyes on Burton. Well, is it not so? Speak up, say. He stopped. The words cut short off on his lips. It came without warning. A crash, a pound on the door below, another. Burton shrank back against the wall. My God, the police, he gasped. Madden found out. We're, we're caught. Jimmy Dale's eyes on old Isaac narrowed. The pounding in the alleyway grew louder, more insistent. And then his first suspicion passed. It was no game of Isaac's. Crafty though the old fox was, the other's surprise and agitation was too genuine to be questioned. Still the pounding continued. Someone was kicking viciously at the door, and banging a tattoo on the panels with his fists. Old Isaac's claw-like hands doubled suddenly. Oh, it is some drunken shot, he snarled out, that knows no better than to come here and rouse the whole neighborhood. It is true, in a moment we will have the police running in from the street, but wait, wait, I'll teach the fool a lesson. He dashed around the table, ran for the window, wrenched the catch up, flung the window open, and, snarling again, leaned out, and instantly the knocking ceased. And instantly, then, with a sharp cry, as the whole ghastly meaning of it swept upon him, Jimmy sprang after the other, too late. Came the roar of a revolver shot, a stream of flame cutting the darkness of the alleyway from the window in the house opposite, and, without a sound, old Isaac, crumpled up, hung limply for a moment over the sill, and slid in a heap to the floor. End of Part 1, Chapter 7b The Man in the Case From The Adventures of Jimmy Dale by Frank L. Packard Read by Lars Rolander